Thanks. Um, well, thanks very much for both the presentations um, and for the report as well from the Asia Foundation, which I really enjoyed reading and read alongside the Global Peace Index uh, report for 2013 that just came out. And I was really struck by the similarities, in a way, in some of the findings from the two reports. So in, in the Global Peace Index report, while the Asia Pacific as a whole um, was sort of seen to be one of the most peaceful regions of the world, um, the four countries that, that fared the worst and were seen to really pull it down were Indonesia, the Philippines, Myanmar, and North Korea. Um, and so, you know, recognition of these conflicts and I think their impacts is, is, is sort of increasing. Um, and the report also noted that these countries weren't what they called the sort of risers and fallers, which I think fits with your, cate you know, your categorization of saying these aren't conflicts that have recently emerged, nor are they conflicts that are, that are getting any better um, or, or going away. So I thought all of this chimed quite nicely um, with the Asia Foundation report. Uh, so I guess I wanted to raise three issues or questions um, for the speakers and, and for discussion. The first is around uh, what a lot of this means for the security development nexus. Um, the second is around maybe what it means for discussions about how to include conflict in the post-2015 uh, debates. And then finally, um, about what donors can do about some of these conflicts. So on the security development nexus, Tom's presentation highlighted that the majority of subnational conflicts um, are now taking place in sort of stable middle-income countries with relatively strong governments, regular elections, um, capable security forces, um, and so on. And some of the data in the, the uh, Asia Foundation report shows that economic transformation in Asia, particularly since sort of the mid-1970s, doesn't seem to have any impact um, on the long-term trajectory of the conflicts. Um, and equally that the subnational conflicts don't seem to have very much impact on national economic growth. So given those sorts of things, I wonder what the implications are for you know, the security development nexus as we normally think of it. Um, you know, much of the current state building agenda and particularly things like security sector reform are predicated on this idea that security and development are mutually reinforcing, um, that security will provide a stable environment um, for development to happen and that development will in turn strengthen um, security and make conflict less likely. Um, but this clearly doesn't seem to help us explain these particular subnational conflicts that we're talking about here. Um, and in Myanmar, you know, development seems to be forging ahead despite severe insecurity um, for, for some of the population. So I wondered if you could maybe both just say something about uh, how development and security uh, interrelate in these contexts or, you know, if they, if they do at all. Um, following on from this, the other the part of the analysis that I found really interesting in the report um, was that conflict doesn't seem to be caused by poverty in these conflicts, but actually rather by discrimination and issues of, of injustice. And I actually think this chimes quite a lot with what we know about conflict in fragile states. I don't think um, it's all that different. Um, and this kind of suggests that in terms of ending conflict, we might need to focus more on issues of inequality than we do on issues of economic development. Um, this seems to resonate, uh, I think, in the various contexts that, that both of you um, have been discussing. So aside from what this means for the security development nexus, the second question I had is what it means for efforts to include conflict-related issues in the post-2015 framework. Um, to date, I think most of the debate around this has centred on trying to lift the, the bottom billion, you know, the fragile states, um, f you know, lift them out of poverty on the basis that poverty and weak states are what drives conflict. Um, but in, if a conflict is a conflict goal, I guess, that, that focuses predominantly on fragile state experience sufficient to capture, um, you know, the kinds of conflict that we've been talking about today? Or uh, does the debate and the kinds of indicators that end up getting included need to factor in these other types of conflict, particularly given the sort of astonishing statistic in the report that more people have died in these conflicts, you know, than in, any, than in all other forms of conflict combined um, in, in the 10-year period? And I think if it's actually inequality and not weak state capacity and poverty that drives insecurity, then it would seem important to ensure that it's these factors that get included in our ideas of conflict in, in something like the post-MDG framework. And this then also might be a bit of a counterweight, I guess, to the momentum that's sort of driving the, the fragile states agenda, the peace building and state building goals, which are much more about how do we extend state capacity in these contexts rather than addressing issues of inequality and, and injustice. And then the final point um, I guess I wanted to raise was in relation to what donors can do about this. Uh, and the report, Tom, I noticed you had to skim over it a bit, but the report focuses quite heavily on the fact that um, part of the reason why donors seem to have found it so hard to engage with these conflicts is because it's difficult for them to sort of, they, or they have a limited understanding of local level dynamics. 
And I wanted to unpack that a bit further. Um, and I think that you know part of the reason that they have such a limited um, understanding of these local dynamics is because of their organisational features. Mm -hmm. So you know the fact that donor offices are invariably located in capital cities, mm -hmm. that they might not speak local languages, that they're rotated in and out of country every three years, um, that they have short-term funding cycles, and so on. All these things mean that it's very hard to build an understanding of, of subnational dynamics, and importantly, to build the sort of political relationships that are important to having you know an understanding of local dynamics. So I was interested in, in these kinds of factors and how they can be overcome and whether that's, um, that's something that, that you looked at at all. Uh, and then I guess a bit more pessimistically, pessimistically, I started wondering, well, is there anything that donors can really do, you know, given these constraints that they work in, given, as you say, they actually have really limited influence in a lot of middle-income countries, um, and given that donors, uh, that the host mm -hmm. governments uh, are going to want them to sort of channel their support into uncontentious areas, what role, you know, do you see aid sort of being able to play here? Um, I think I might leave it there. <laughs>